Yes, what a treat we've got for you today. We've got a couple of broadcasting legends, and uh, Chick Young's also came on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you could take it, Chick. <laughs> How you doing, all right? Good part of the brilliant, Sam. <laughs> mate, son. Right, first question is, just don't know how much time I've got, what time's uh, bus back to Craig Lynn? Because we turn up in Cardigan, <laughs> Jack and Victor. No, right, my first question is serious. Eyes question, though, right, you ready? I'm a field footballer, that's why I've gotten in the media. How, what was your two route in the media? Because was you the same or you hope was it football? He, he thinks he's in the media. Do <laughs> 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 so you try that I'm again? I'm going to get his thinking at it. Right, how did you used to get in the media? Uh, as Bertie always say, a good drink would kill him. I know. <laughs> we uh, see the difference is we never thought we were players. You think you're in the media. No, I was hopeless. I know. We never thought, but you're, you think you're in the media. It was a very, very straightforward route in those days, Simon. I, I started on the 5th of January 1970. I can tell you the exact date. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was a very st straightforward case of applying for a job then, uh, getting an interview, and then it was up to you. And I worked for a company who took the view that they'd hired you because they thought you had some potential. Now get on with it. Mm -hmm. What was that about you, you think, was suited to the media? Though? Uh, as my wife always says, you've made not very much go a very long way. <laughs> so, uh, quite simply, leaving all modesty to one side, the ability to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what they were looking for. They were looking for somebody that, that could write, wouldn't take forever to be schooled in the way of writing in newspapers, uh, and who had enough native cunning to just get on with the job. Because I started on the 5th of January. On the 6th of January, I was standing outside Celtic Park interviewing Billy McNeil, uh -huh. who three years earlier had been the first British footballer to hold up the European Cup. So that's what I mean by sink or swim. Day two, Billy McNeil, off you go. And is it still like that these days or do you feel it's basically anyone that can get in it? Oh, the world's completely different to the... Your mirror. <laughs> <laughs> the world is a completely different place now. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, is that frustrating? No, it's not frustrating because Chick and I have been there, done it and soiled the t-shirt. Uh, so, you know, it, it's an entirely different world of social media, Twitter, all that. We started no mobile phones, no computers. No ability. <laughs> <laughs> and all of Betty typewriter on a sheet of A4 paper, and that was it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Chet? How did you get in Well, see, Shuggy's much more clever than me. I would never oh, attempt to phrase yeah. native cunning on air. That would take <laughs> Horribly wrong. <laughs> and anyways, a Johnny come lately because I started in August 1969 in the Daily Record where, you know, I realised I would have loved to be a player, Simon, and, and I realised I was like, I had everything by the ability, basically. <laughs> and I realised <laughs> it earlier on and I thought, right, plan B. And, and, you know, I've made a mess of many things in my life, but I, I kind of got professionally where I wanted to be. And, I, and looking back, I'd, I had the, in the 60s, I had the, knowledge of the, the brainwave to actually take shorthand in typing at school with me and the 30 girls in a class. You know I mean? <laughs> so you've got to realise how brave that was in the 60s, you know, and, and that helped me. And, I got, and then you just apply, as, as, as Shuggy will tell you, the whole thing called Willing's Press Guide, which listed every, just about every paper in the world. And um, I applied, wrote letters and letters and letters. And famously one day, two letters popped through my mum's letterbox. One was from the Daily Record, and one was in Stornoway Gazette, <laughs> one offering me a job and one rejecting me. Curiously, I got knocked by by the Stornoway Gazette and offered a job with the Daily Record <laughs> as a copy boy. We're, and I we're, started there. We're, we're basically here because we'd have been rubbish at anything else. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Uh, we were all hoping you'd take the job in Stornoway. I'd often wonder, <laughs> often wonder <laughs> what would have happened to me <laughs> if I'd got to Stornoway in 1969. <laughs> you don't really know much about geography of Scotland, do you? No. <laughs> Stornoway to Peterhead. Is that nowhere near each other, isn't it? It's up north, isn't it? <laughs> it's up north, no, yeah. No. <laughs> right, what would you, was there a big moment or was there a moment that you consider your big break? <laughs> you ever thought about a job in Carmack or something like that? Stormy way to your head, right? You know? I, don't, I think the big breaks in my life came much, much later on. I mean, I, I went to Radio Clyde, which, uh, as Chick will tell you, immediately heightens your profile. I get thrown out the Celtic Supporters Club by Kenny Dalgleish. That really heightens your profile. And whose decision was that, Kenny's? Oh, no doubt it was, yeah. Why? 
Uh, at the time, I just felt that Celtic as a club were making a complete mess of it. Uh, and he, top three greatest Celtic players of all time, was making a mess of his role or roles, whether it was director of football or interim manager when John Barnes had to get the sack. So, again, Chick knows, you have to express your feelings. And he disliked the way I expressed the feelings. Uh, and uh, I was thrown out by a man uh, who was called Finn Barrow Brannigan. Uh, but that wasn't his real name. Uh, and two weeks later at Dens Park, I had the wonderful experience Neither of us, having played professional football, had the wonderful experience of the Celtic supporters chanting my name. And it was Huey Keevan's... Goalie. And it, they, they confused me. They thought I, I was a banker. <laughs> um, so uh, so the, the experience of the Celtic supporters chanting my name and Kenny Dalglish turning to the supporters and going... <laughs> would, <laughs> would, would, would people in football hold that against you back then? You hadn't played football. Would that, ever, would that get labelled at you? No. Nah, never spoken of it. I don't, I, I never, you know, I don't actually recall too many people going down the show as your medals route, you know, because you never played it. I think now, probably, I mean, I think there are fewer. You and I made pretty good careers out of being pundits as well as reporters, as well as being, you know, newspapers, radio, television in my case. And I think now it's much, it's much harder for someone who hasn't played the game to get involved. You, you try and name me a younger generation of people who have come through the way we did, who is a household name in terms of not being an ex-player. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who's come through. Like that, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And why do you think that is? Um, I, think, I think there's producers, directors, people who hire now are wooed by ex-players who think they can come into the game and, and, and become Journalists. Um, they would rather have a famous person say it yeah, yeah. than someone uh, who simply did it for a living. Uh, and that goes for all forms of the media, newspaper, television and radio. I, I picked up a newspaper yesterday actually and, and I couldn't find a piece written by a journalist. And it needed the hiring players and, uh, and they're getting paid for, for what I used to earn anyway. Mm. Washers really. And they just hire a name. But these people can't write, you know, I, I don't... <laughs> as, Come on, Dave, Dave, you're talking about it. I don't think... You tell me any ex-player... Well, I'll tell you one who can, David Proven. Right. David Proven's probably the exception to the rule that anyone else who writes a column, you go, fat cat sat on Matt. Nobody... You, you know, used to buy, I, used, <laughs> I used to buy... I used to buy... To take the dark stream, I used to buy The Observer or, or The Sunday Times based on whatever paper Hugh McIlvany was was working for because I wanted to read how he could write, mm -hmm. and, and, but you don't, but now just because it's a name and somebody giving up an opinion, because he's an ex-Rangers player, he backs Rangers, former Celtic player, backs Celtic. Sorry, yawn, you know, you, you, and, and, and I'm not, if ex-players and you listen to great players giving an opinion and, and tactically and what, so, what should have happened, or a player should have struck a ball, all that, yes, I get all that. Totally different from conducting interviews, for example. Mm -hmm. Although it does have its advantages. Uh, I used to, assist Chris Sutton, if I can put it that way, in the writing of his column for the Daily Record. And the first Christmas that we were doing it, uh, a hamper, a Fortnum and Mason's hamper, arrived at my house sent by Chris Sutton. So it's bad you get anything Mason's. <laughs> uh, and he's also the only guy who ever texted me and said, Hugh, can we do the column on Thursday? I'm grouse shooting on Friday. <laughs> so, uh, an absolute gentleman. Uh, Hugh, uh, Chick, I want to ask you about your, your time at Buttons. I've spoken about it briefly on the podcast. I want to go and be in it. What do you want me to say? How was it? <laughs> how did it come about? Yeah, I'll tell you how it came about. I was working... I'd worked for the Scottish Daily News, which shut down in November 75. Brilliant time, and it lasted six months. And curiously, that was the paper which was started when the Scottish Daily Express uh, they closed down and, and they, the workers on the Daily Express put their money into starting the, the, what was a workers' cooperative newspaper. Uh, it, was, it was brilliant for me. It was the first national daily I'd really worked on. Uh, curiously, in the wake of that, the late John McKenzie, the voice of football, who was a brilliant guy, 
a kind of mentor to me. He got me working for the Daily Express on a, on a kind of freelance basis through the season 75, 76. We got to about April 76 and he said, well, I can't give you shifts through the summer, but I've set you up with an interview tomorrow. It was in the Central Hotel, what for? A media office at Butman's. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a football writer. I don't want to. He said, just go to the interview. So I went to the interview and the guy said, look, I'd worked in national papers. I'd worked in local papers. I'd worked at, I'd been editor of a, I'd been editor of a football magazine by this time, Scottish Football Week, I was only 23. I was, you know, grossly overqualified. The guy offered me the job on the spot. I said, I don't know. I don't know if this is what I want to do. He said, you can have any one of the camps throughout, throughout Britain that I wanted. I said, well, if I was 10, I would just go to air. I went back to the office and John said, how are you going? I said, go off the job on the spot. He said, what was the money like? And I told him, and he said, can you afford to give them that every week? <laughs> said, what do you mean? He says, just take it, you'll find out. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he made me take it. Um, it only lasted, it only lasted, I don't think it was even two months, but, and then a, a guy called John Penman, who he was at the sports head of the Express, which the Scottish Daily Express, which was run from Manchester, bizarrely, the bun, he phoned me up and said, what are you doing there? He says, week Monday, you start the Express in Manchester, get your backside down and hung the phone up. And, and I, well, and I had, to, had to leave Valhalla. <laughs> <laughs> Why did that guy want you to take that job, Jenny? To see me through the summer, because he couldn't offer me shifts. That's right. that, so I had to do something. Uh, and I went and... and and I'd smile even now, thinking back, <laughs> Si, I just... <laughs> happy days. I, I, mean, I, I, was, I was 25, single, an MGB sports car, Barry White 8-track. <laughs> now he just... <laughs> shoot you, shoot you in. <laughs> <laughs> now, he, <laughs> now he just thinks he's 25 uh, and single. I know. But is he just on your end? Did you still first meet him? Yes, I said. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I have no idea there were... Several of us went down the road together. There was Chick, myself, Jim Blair, Alan Davidson. Sadly, neither is with I'm us. I'm just saying. <laughs> so it's the two years left. Big, big Ronnie Scott in the Sunday Post. Yeah, yeah. Um, some guys who were great to me. Met, I, talk, I mentioned John McKenzie, Kenny Gallagher. used to work for the Daily Record and the Sun. I mean, I worked as a cubby boy <coughs> in the record. So, oh, Huey Taylor, God, God rest him. God, they are all going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all great to me. I'm a huge of people who mentored him, but it was. I just fell in love with, with the world and the newspaper offices and the flavour of it all and the fun and and you know the boozing that went on. There was a, there was a culture. Don't get me wrong, but I would argue to this day the party spirit and what happened in trips and all the rest of it. There was still more work, better stories. Yeah. coming out of that environment than, than there is now. Would you all help each other back then? Because now it seems quite cutthroat with, with people in there. Well, I mean, the, the, I, I don't think uh, that you necessarily helped each other, but you, you wouldn't have hindered each other. Uh, I think you applauded. You know, if, 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 if one of the other guys got a genuine exclusive yeah. and it's a much abused word, you'd go, well done. And then you'd have to go and get the follow-up. But Chick's you know? talking about the sheer fun of it all while getting the work done. My first trip abroad was to East Germany before the Berlin Wall, long, long before the Berlin Wall fell. And we went through Checkpoint Charlie, literally at midnight. And we walked from the west into the, the east, went along the Unter den Linden, which is the most famous street there. Uh -huh. I went oh, into yeah. the hotel. The hotel had a Hollywood staircase I went up the Hollywood staircase and the room next to mine, the door was slightly ajar and I recognised the voices and I went in and there was one reporter standing on the coffee table in the middle of the room with a pair of underpants on his head singing, my love is like a red, red rose. <laughs> I know who that is. Yes. <laughs> I can identify him by the song. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I really love this business. This is, uh... When I started, the first, and I can't bring myself to call him Jock Steen, Mr. Steen and Mr. Waddle, Willie Waddle at Rangers, it was my job many days. And you, in these days, you phoned the managers of Rangers Celtic direct, yeah. and their phone rang in their office. Uh, and of course, I was a young lad. I used to stare at that phone, psyching myself up <laughs> to phone them. I was shit scared uh, that I was going to, you know, and, and they would, depending on what mood you got them in, 
It was best to phone Willie Waddle in the mornings, actually, that's another story, but before <laughs> he got his lunch. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, his lunch could be... Lavish. 70, 70 proof. <laughs> 70 proof. I was, I was, uh, at, at, the, at the same time, I was told, don't ask Jockstein a question unless you're absolutely certain you can get to the end of it. You know, because he was such a figure of awe. Yeah. Uh, he used to say to me, uh, what's your pals at Ibrook saying yeah, today? Yeah. And of course, I would just spout the board from Billy Monitor. And if he thought he had a, if he thought he had a better line for Celtic, he would say, well, you might want to be suggesting that such and such. Or if he thought he's nothing, you know, he, if he could get Rangers off the back page, then we'd feed your line. Yeah. And if he felt what, you'd, what Rangers had, he would just, I mean, just blabbed all out. Uh, and he would, uh, <laughs> and of course it worked the other way as well. Um, uh, and and, and, and Willie Waddle, <laughs> verbal, he, he bullied me. Didn't he? And then years later, when I started in Radio Clyde, and, and Jimmy Sanderson and I were debating, uh, and, and of course, Willie Waddle had worked with Jimmy Sanderson in the Daily Express, during the 60s and it never really got on because, so he, he, he said to me, <laughs> Radio Clyde, and Jimmy Sanders ran out when he was great to me, <clears throat> but <laughs> Mr. Waddle said to me, I met him, I do once, ah, you're doing great in that radio, he says, don't let that wee man bully you, I've always supported you, I've taught you everything, I kept, took care of you. And I thought, did she? What? <laughs> <laughs> but of course I went, yes, Mr. Ward, no, Ron, don't let that be man, Bill, you just sort him out. My first mistake was to call him Willie. Oh! Um, uh, <laughs> I in, don't know the answer the, to that. In the foyer at Ibrox after the game, and I mean, the question would have been, will there be any injuries or something? But the fact that I called him Willie, and he just, his glasses went down, halfway down his nose, and he said, did you go to school tonight? <laughs> don't remember you in my class at school. Uh, I used to and, say. I said, <laughs> and I had no recollection of Willie being at St Thomas Aquinas, so <laughs> so uh, I said, nah. <laughs> he just turned him halfway up the marble staircase. Willie, Willie. Brilliant. See, and that's what I said, Mr. Waddle, Mr. Snow. <laughs> Great respect. Uh, just you mentioned Clyde one there. When did you first hear about the plans, the, the phenomenon that is the, the radio Clyde phoning? Well, it was always there. Uh, Richard Park. Uh, brought the idea back from America. Uh, Chicks talking about Jimmy Sanderson. My first few months at Radio Clyde with a midweek phone in after a game. And Jimmy Sanderson, in those days you could smoke in the studio, do anything you like, and he's smoking away a big cigar. cigar. Uh, so he's in full flow, fulminating, and uh, threw the cigar down. So a few minutes later, I'm trying to signal to Richard Park, the other side of the desk, and he gave me the full stupid boy look. Uh, well, you've kind of given me a few times, eh? <laughs> went on and on and on until we got to the commercial break, and he took off his cans and said, what? I said, the studio's on fire. <laughs> Jimmy had thrown his <laughs> cigar, and there was a wee blaze going on. And I thought, I don't know much about radio, but I know that can't be very good. Uh, so, Again, uh, it was a phenomenon. Uh, Jimmy was the, the prototype. The rest of us are following on. Uh, but he, Jimmy Sanderson, simply made it. Every, everyone knows his catchphrases. Uh, and he, more than any other individual, popularised the phone. Some good times on it, Chip. Well, <clears throat> the first time I was on Radio Clyde was um, so... I take you back to 73 and I, was, I became editor of, of a magazine, it was a monthly magazine, and Ian Peebles, another gentleman, sadly gone, and ran a company called Peebles Publications, and they got me back from London to work on a monthly football magazine called Scottish Football. And then over a period of time, they decided to make it Scottish Football Weekly, and I was asked to be editor, I was only 23. Um, so, uh, the, being on the publicity bandwagon for the magazine, they decided I was the youngest editor of a national publication in Britain. Whether it was or not, I don't know, but they, that's what they claimed. Mm -hmm. So, they sent me around various, I was interviewed by various people, including being on what became, I might even still have been then, Super Scoreboard. So that would be 1973, and Richard Park and Paul Cooney were running the show, Bob Crampsey, mm -hmm. the great Bob Crampsey, Sir Robert to me, was on, and I was interviewed as part of the programme about my appointment. Uh, and, and a little while after, Richard phoned me up and said, would you like to become part of the programme? And I started doing 
used to walk along from the evening, I was working the evening times, so used to do a lunchtime sports desk, walk from the evening times in Mitchell Street to Anderson where they, they were. And that's how I, I kind of started in, in, in Radio Clyde. And then my editor, uh, George McKechnie at the evening times decided it was that I shouldn't be on. The, I was giving away evening time stories. There was a big clash between broadcasting right. and, and, and newspaper at the time. Although I was getting called Chick Young of the Evening Times, and I thought they were getting great publicity, uh, he didn't see it that way. Uh, and then he tried to, to, to stop me, and I, 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 I can't remember what, it, 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 that went on for a while. Um, and then eventually I left the, the Times, and everything started happening after that for me, and I left the Times in, in 88, but, mm -hmm. which 11 of the happiest, that's another story altogether at the Evening Times. So the broadcasting started to bleed in to my to my life in the 70s. I mean, Simon, don't sit here and think, and I think I can speak for you in this, and think we sat down left school, right, this is what, what's going to happen. I'm going to work for a magazine. I went to London to work in the old Charles Buggins Football Monthly. Then I'll do a bit of paper. Old broadcasting, radio, television. It's it's like the wind and the tide come along and sweep you in directions. And like he will say, I've got away with it and I've timed it. Yeah. <laughs> 50 years of getting away with it is, is, is fair enough. Yeah. And I don't care what people think what I did because I've had a ball. Uh, and there was a great headline I read once about a Hollywood Hellraiser. Uh, and it said, it was a Daily Mirror, no Donald Zeck interview or something. I can't remember who the, the Hellraiser was. But it said, sometimes I wake up at three in the morning in a cold sweat and I think about the things I've done and the people I've been with. Uh, and I go and, and I worry about it. He said, then I think, what the hell, I had a ball and I fall back asleep again. Right, and that's I'm exactly, that yeah. sums up. No, that's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, Macca thinks he's done it all, you know. He get found out. But see, on the phone, has there been a moment or a, or a phone call you, you'll never forget? Um, I remember going back one night to the house and uh, my wife said to me, how was the programme? And I said, well, you know, you always know whether it's been good, bad or indifferent. I said, that was a really good programme, except one guy gave me it tight. Uh, and I'll, it'll show you how many years ago it was, we were having a conversation about Danny McGrain. And I said, well, you know, Danny's at an age where you have to use him sparingly now. He is without question a Celtic legend, but he has to be used sparingly as he approaches this time of his career and so on and so forth. So the guy wasn't having it, gave me terrible abuse. And my wife said, oh, I know why. And I said, how do you know? You never listened to the programme. Why well, he said, oh, you phoned for here. <laughs> and, and I, he was phoning from my house. From your house? He said, do you remember the guy came and he was going to plumb in a dishwasher and washing machine? we just moved into the house. And he said to me at five o'clock, we'd be all right if I used your phone, Mrs. Kevens. And he said, <laughs> no chance. Really? I said, so you're telling me that I was getting verbally abused and I was paying for the call. Probably. Uh, so that's the grip it has. And uh, what about yourself, Chip? Well, I remember I worked for a while fitting for and didn't they wash machines. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know what I mean, you missed him here, Mr. Sellers. He's been in the house, I'll tell you about uh, that later. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't remember any dramatic, but you, you, some real, in the middle of all of this, for example, I was. I was at Wales when, when Mr. Steen died you know, that night and things, and you just, and I was on the Scotland plane, which flew back to Edinburgh that night, and there was, you know, all these moments, and we were up all night writing stuff for the paper the next day. All these kind of moments, you're at moments in history, the World Cups mm -hmm. that I've covered, and you think, you know, I never for one moment at any time said, this is the real world, because it, cause it never, <laughs> never was. And I thought, how long can I get, get away with it? <laughs> and how long can you go on? But, but, I underline again, when you were away, you worked. You, you worked and you did your job first before you undoubtedly went out to play. Again, people will remember uh, when Jock Brown was Celtic's general manager. And on the day that he left, Jock had his own particular style of working. It didn't go down well with the Celtic supporters and people behind the scenes at Celtic. So. That morning I received a call from someone who was not officially a part of Celtic but worked for those who were. And he said, uh, meet me in the car park. And he phoned me when I got to the car park. He said, don't get out of the car. He said, I'm giving you an hour of a start. He said, Jock has left the club. A press release will be going out and 
I'm giving you first shot at it. So I went up and said, just, we need to break in to whatever program's on and I will break this news. So it broke news. So your man comes over to me and says, are you absolutely certain? And I said, check, 100%. So he was away and he comes back 10 minutes later and I hear him putting on the cans and he said, Radio Scotland can exclusively reveal. <laughs> <laughs> Never reveal your sources. <laughs> but it was the opposition. <coughs> did you pay a lot? What did you expect me to do it? I know. Listen, I, 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 if I have ever had a crossword with you, I can't remember it. Uh, because we both understood the demands of the job. We both understood the nice part of the job when you get to relax, the, the travel. Etc. Etc. But I've never had an occasion where I, where I, I fell out with them. Mm -hmm. and, and that day, the two of us just laughed. Uh, brilliant. Uh, you left the Clyde to go to BBC. How did that go down with the bosses, considering you were going to arrival? Well, it, it, it became bizarre, Simon, because I, so so many jobs, so many places. <laughs> but ultimately, uh, it, was, it was here actually at Hamden that um, I, I, had, I decided to leave. The Evening Times, where I was very happy, I, but I could see other things happening. Uh, and Paul Cooney at Radio Clyde said, like, you can do the breakfast show sport, we'll give you a guarantee of this. Uh, I was writing a column, I had a deal with the people in newspapers on a Sunday, um, and I packaged, I put packaged together bits and pieces to earn some money. Uh, and then one night here at Hamden in 88, this guy came up to me and said, um, uh, all right, I had no idea who it was. Uh, how do you fancy doing some stuff for us then? Now, I had no idea who it was, and he hadn't introduced himself, but I could smell money. <laughs> 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 yeah. And it turned out a great guy called Mike Abbott, who was running sport at BBC Scotland, they were launching a kind of a Saturday preview programme, which is a kind of Scottish version of Football Focus, which at that time was going to be presented by was presented by Bill McFarlane and I think Jim Craig, and they wanted me as a reporter. So I went to see them the next day. They said, right, we would do stuff for Saturday. And that was it. And I get into television. So, so that, that ran and ran. And for, that was 88 to about 94. And I was at this bizarre thing. So I got a contract in the BBC, television instruct. It was very good to me, very kind to me. They changed the presenters, but I survived every revolution. <laughs> Became Friday sports scene, Rob McQueen, Hazel Irvin. I was still the, the reporter uh, from 88 through to, oh, in 2000. And, oh, I'm still doing stuff less for television now, but but the, the, the point was that somewhere down the line, I'd been working, I was working for Radio Clyde on a Saturday in BBC television. Uh, and they, they felt this was in Congress. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you inherited <laughs> that situation. So um, we got to a stage where I think 94, Hugh, where, where Radio Clyde had lost the rights to commentary um, and BBC were picking it up. Uh, but Alex Dixon, who was the gaffer at, at uh, Radio Clyde, God rest him, had to, had to make up. He, he needed people who could talk all day. That's me. <laughs> so about, you know, not, nothing really. So we, unbelievable offers, but the BBC wanted to buy me out from Clyde to do television and radio. And I had this day where I left Radio Clyde saying, right, I'm staying with Radio Clyde and driving up the road, um, Dougie Wernham, who was a gaffer at Radio Scotland, said, no, you're not. Meet me in a bar on Great Western Road. And I sat, I went back to the local pub and I didn't know what to do. But the BBC had eventually offered me more money. But I'd felt I'd let Davy Proven and Derek Johnston and Hugh, I don't know if you were involved at that time, down. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I said, and I, and I phoned David Provence and David said to me, so you're telling me you get offered more money from the BBC than, than Clyde, what we got today? I said, yeah. He said, I've only got one phrase for you. Um, Good day at White Rock, that's what he said. <laughs> I always remember that. And I, and I went and I, and I sold my soul to the BBC and I, and I never, never worked for, well, so far, never been back to Clyde. Uh, brilliant. See, so just back to your sale on Clyde, you're always kind of known as that pantomime villain. Yeah. Did that bother you? No. Never? Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember going uh, to Spain to interview Gusedink, and Chick was there. Oh, what a great man. We, we had a great night out, him and I, 
And he said to me that every time somebody went, <laughs> it was another pound in the till. <laughs> so uh, I regard being the grim reaper, the panto baddie, uh, as the very best thing mm -hmm. because it guarantees you longevity uh, as Chick's laugh did for him. I mean, you're more to it than that, but if people associate you with something, then fine, milk it for all it's worth. Did he ever get hassled on the street? Well, 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 on well, that. Well, the Goose Head Inc. trip, so the rumour was that Goose Head Inc. was going to the next Celtic manager. That's it. Right. So I had said to the BBC, um, let's get to Seville, because that's where he was. Where he was. So a, a pack of his queue obviously went for, what were you, what were you the record then? Meal, Sunday meal. Sunday meal, and then, so we, off we thought, okay, that's right, it would be a Friday. Um, so we all get, or Thurs, we went to Thurs, whoever it was, and we get to Seville, Hiddink, gentlemen. So there, there's me, Hugh, maybe one or two others, and got to who the Hiddink at the training, and um, he said to me, uh, you're all here because you think I'm going to the next manager of Celtic? Yes, yes we are. He said, well, let me tell you, I'm not. He said, but that's not much good to you, is it? <laughs> I said, not really. He said, set your camera up. <laughs> so we did this interview. God bless this man. He went on about what a great club Celtic are and how they must be attracting, you know, who would not be interested and all that, and gave us a, a, a line. Yeah. It, was, it was absolutely brilliant. And he finished, he said, right, if you're out for a drink tonight in a restaurant, here's the restaurant you go to. <laughs> You'll get a receipt there. God bless me. Yeah. And then he said, there's no chance I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because none of us used that line. Uh, but when you said that you ever get any hassle on the street, it wasn't, technically speaking, the street. It was the platform of Clydebank Central Station. Right. Uh, and the, the window opened and I get thumped by a gammon roll. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an, an odd form of criticism, but the, it comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, the specky tube stuff and that. Is there, is there that, that? that was phenomenal. And when they get Robert Pires to, <laughs> see, to see it, uh, <laughs> and then it was like Pires endorsing you. Uh, so that, uh, my poor wife sometimes says, what are you doing now? <laughs> Specky tube. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but my grandchildren absolutely love it. Love it, how do you we, call we, it? We actually got in a, a trail for Friday Sports in the 98 World Cup when I went to um, March before the 98 Summer World Cup. Obviously, I went to Stuttgart, Brazil, we're playing Germany. Uh, and I managed to get in the Brazil hotel uh, and I get an exclusive interview with Romario and uh, we persuaded, or the interpreter persuaded Romario, I did the trail uh, and Romario said to me, saying, this, tonight, this week or tonight in Friday Sports scene, an exclusive interview looking at Brazil ahead of the, we were playing them, the World Cup and an exclusive interview with the, one of the greatest players, Romario, and he just finished the trail by going, this is me, Chick Young. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Romario. Wow. I know. But I, and, and he gave me his Brazil top, which at the World Cup, I got signed by Pele. See, you can raise you with that one, Simon. Wow, you can't beat that. Can, no. I, can you beat that, you know? And he knew no. the distance from Stone away to Peterhead as well, <laughs> didn't he? Well, I done Josh Windass yesterday. That's really? Similar wow. That, similar so, stories. Uh, <laughs> um, Talk about the Goose Hiddink there. I want to just touch on managers. Obviously, you would be incident with Kenny Dalglish, but... You were going to get a mic up your arse for the Archie Knox. <laughs> Talk us through that, because I love that. Well, I think, <laughs> try, it's a long story, but basically I went, it was the day after Rangers played AK Athens, 93 I think it was. I went to Abbott's, and you've got to start this with known, and Walter Smith and I are, are great friends, mm -hmm. but he can be one grumpy. So, <laughs> the next morning I'm sent, uh, uh, and the cameraman, if you've seen the clip on YouTube, the cameraman is, a, is a, a guy called Billy Frew, who's another one who's sadly no longer with us. So I have to hang around in Walter, and he's not going to do an interview. He eventually goes, set up in the tunnel. So we're set up in the tunnel, and I get him, and he's just in one hell of a mood because, you know, you've seen the clip when I, you know, the players not good enough, and, and Basil Bowie, and, and I. And, and the, the beauty is, he's going, Walter swore, in, in these days, he swore at me every. 10 seconds because he knew I wouldn't use it. We couldn't use it if he was swearing. So <laughs> the beauty is, of course, 
And you, if you see the camera shaking, and he turns to Billy, he says, no wonder you're laughing, Billy, because Billy's got the camera right. And of course, I'm pissing myself as well. But the beauty is, we're shooting down the tunnel, and, and Archie Knox happens to walk perfectly through the frame and says, and Walter turns to you heard his effing questions. And of course, Archie says, I want to tell you, it's like he's microwave with effing arse, right? <laughs> right through, brilliantly framed, and we're all laughing, right? But anyway, I, I've still not got clip, a clip for, for reporting Scotland. Uh -huh. So we, um, we eventually get him something, and only 20 seconds from him, I get that, and I get it taken away. So I go back and edit it, and these days it was tape. So you just, what you used to do after you edit the thing, it was a big recycling bin. I thought, no, I'm not recycling, I'm keeping that in my drawer. So I kept in the drawer, that Christmas, <coughs> there was a memo, it was not even emails in these days, memo came round, as end again, stuff for the BBC Christmas tape. Now I'm telling you, the BBC in-house Christmas tape was the best thing that came out of BBC Scotland. It was beautifully crafted, uh, much better than any we ever produced for, in our programmes. <laughs> and I said, I've got this thing with Walter Smith. So I went into that, um, the clip, you know. So in the next, about January, February next year, and I got a phone, I remember I was in Marseille, I got a clip, a phone call from the News of the World, there's this tape going around the pubs, a VHS tape of Walter Smith, and you, ha, ah, hang on, I told them a story, and I said, look, this wouldn't exist, because they thought they were getting to me. I said, this wouldn't exist if I hadn't kept the tape. Yeah. So anyway, that, so we went around all the pubs and the things started to grow about. Then we go fast forward to about 2004, the reason I remember this, <coughs> just after the turn of the millennium, again, I was bizarrely in Marseille, again, it was the news of the world phone to me, and the boy said, there's a thing in YouTube it said half a million hits, you and Walter Smith. I said, first question, what is YouTube? <laughs> so the boy tried to explain to me, and he said, and I, so I got through the whole explanation, and said, you, your paper phoned me 10 years ago, and, and this is how it came to pass. So I phoned Walter, and Walter says, same as me, what the F? What is YouTube? So I tried to explain to him, I said, this is half a million hits. So he says, there must be money in this, because we know nothing about YouTube. Uh, and he, he says, even we got, you know, 10 pence a hit, that's a lot of money. He says, we could give it to charity. And I said, well, you can do what you want with your half. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what has happened now, Sam, to bring up speed, for he was proud of it, but he's now mortified because his grand wings oh, have watched yeah. it and go, Grandpa, why are you swearing at that man yeah. in the tell? <laughs> notoriety is the best form of publicity. Yeah. It's about two and a half million people have yeah. watched that. When, you, when I get thrown out of the Celtic club, uh, the first thing the Sunday Mail said to me was, stand there, stay there, we're getting a photographer out so that you can be pictured outside the club that you've just been thrown out of. That, that's the way it works. So on the Saturday night, I get a phone call uh, from the editor to say, look, it's actually a little bit more serious because the guy who threw you out has a criminal record uh, and it involves guns. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, that is a little bit more serious. Uh, so... I didn't tell my wife or anything, and on the Monday, I was at uh, the hole in the wall, and I felt the very blunt object in the middle of my back, and the guy said, take your money and don't turn round. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> and then after a few seconds, he said, right, turn round slowly, and I turned round. It's Bobby Williams and the command. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, any other major ding-dongs, Chip? You've had those? Alec Ferguson didn't speak to me for six years. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's a huff. <laughs> you put his phone down as well? He, he uh, <laughs> World Cup 19. And I remember, he'd been the St Myrne manager. I, I was, I covered, when he became manager of St Myrne in 74, he, he, um, it was about five of us, it wasn't a press conference, it was in the boardroom at Lovesdale, Love Street. He'd come from East Stirling and it was no fuss made at all. Uh, and, I, and I played, you know, five sides with him and all that. Uh, then he went to Aberdeen and he appeared in the west of Scotland, you know, might as well been Russia for him. Yeah. And he got this, and, and what he did, you know, after the left Simmer, what, what he did for Simmer, of course, as well. But um, and then Scotland Manager, 86, long story short, um, he gave us the team to the press for the first game against Denmark, ahead of the game, and said, keep to yourselves. Uh, and he, we asked him for the game, the next game was the Germany game, West Germany, asked him for the team, no, because one of you leaked the team to 
It's Martin Olsen, the manager of yeah. of, of Denmark. Um, one of you, I said, why would we leak the, the, the team to the manager of Denmark? Um, anyway, he said, one of you did, I'm not giving you a team. On the way back, when the, you know, lost, well, we, the Uruguay game put us out, and we were flying home, I was playing Trivial Pursuits, you know, Fergie loves a quiz, mm -hmm. Trivial Pursuits, on the plane, with him, Mike Aiken, I think, and someone else, um, coming back, I mean, that, and then we got to, we got to, back to the UK, he was still at Aberdeen, and uh, he, he, he said to the boy, Ali Guthrie, who was in the Aberdeen Union Express, it was that we so and so young, because I'd been over to see Martin Olsen in Denmark previously, he assumed I had become pally with him, and was leaking the Scotland team. Why would I do that? Mm. So I asked to see him, wouldn't see me, blanked me, then went to Manchester United, and and between, <laughs> between 1986, um, and I doubt Manchester United games doing them when he blanked me. <laughs> And then, <laughs> Would you 2000, two thousand and three, it was the Champions League final, and there was a reception because um, it was here at Hamden, and I was in the City Chambers, standing beside Willie Miller and our guy, and he came into the, comp the company, and he introduced. So oh, this is Willie Miller, my captain, is the guy, and I thought this will be good. This is, <laughs> this, is my, this is my old pal chick from the from you know we used to work in, and that was it, and, it, and like. Did I confront him or did you say what happened in the last, what was that, 16 years or something? Yeah. But, and, and he's been fine with me. He, 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 was, he was ferocious. Uh, no, I mean, serious to him? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, uh, things were so good between us at one point that we used to get a card from Alec and Cathy every Christmas and we'd send them cards and I went down to Old Trafford uh, and to get up to the inner sanctum, mm. to Fergie's private room, I mean, I doubt the Prime Minister would make it, and I want to. It's barely uh, gates at the front. We get, we get in there, and, and he says, that, and it's like Mick Hucknall and Angus Dayton off the telly, and this one and that one. And he said, You'll all have to go to Scotia Nostra's here. Scotia Nostra. And, they, <laughs> and, they, and Mick Hucknall. And he said, Oh, like. Uh, <laughs> That's the time we had the So, <laughs> and we finished up outside Old Trafford after uh, the red wines and all the rest of it. He loved me because my granny and grandfather came from Govan, the Govan Road, mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. So my next visit to Old Trafford, I'm thinking, and he's in the press room, and I motion over to say, get you up the stairs, and he, and he said, no, you can't, and he, <laughs> he, he went right through me, and th that was the end of the story. <laughs> uh, really, yeah? Yeah, never spoke to me again, and I don't know what happened, because I've always been on record on the radio or in newspapers as saying, without question, the greatest Scottish manager of all time, mm. simply because of the body of work there. He's the greatest Scottish manager of all time, without question. I think, <clears throat> in retrospect, um, just before that, I had, I had written, I'd ghostwritten Mo Johnson's autobiography and Mo in, savaged him in one of the chapters. I was on the ghostwriter, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, but I don't think he associated that with me. But it was more Johnson he should have had a problem with. <laughs> but I think it was by association, maybe with some some idea. But I, I can, let me just say that I never, at any point, leaked the Scotland team to Martin Olsen <laughs> or indeed anyone else. I went with Celtic to Germany. I think it was 1979, pre-season, ten days. And I'll tell you how things have changed. I was the only Scottish journalist the Celtic 10 days. Bill Whitney was brilliant to me. I was in pretty good shape at the time. He actually let me train with the team. I'd wow. get Celtic care of that. And then we, you want to left back to the hotel? Yeah, and you used to get in the, the, the bus and um, the, drive, the hang on driver, we don't start this bus to the wee man sung the Celtic song over the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> and I had to sing the Celtic song every time that bus wouldn't move to argue right through it. Brilliant. Right, on you go. See how you're talking about these managers, it's brilliant. Would you, consider, would you consider them friends at that time? Yeah, it was possible, yeah. Um, I mean, I would have considered Big Billy, uh, Tam Burns, uh, Walter, uh, very, very quick story. Walter could swear at machine gun speed and was pretty much the best I'd heard, but one day uh, I came 
into the foyer at Ibrooks and, and he came out and he said, was I supposed to see you? And I said, no, no, no. He said, what's up? I said, listen, I've got Janet's nephew outside uh, and he's a big Rangers fan and he's had a major operation. If you could, you know, arrange for somebody to get a photograph to you. Know, mm -hmm. He said, wait a minute. He said, are you telling me you've got Rangers supporters in your family? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's Walter. That's the way it is in the modern world. Walter <coughs> Smith took him, made a major brain operation. Walter Smith himself took him all over Ibrox, got all the photographs, made them all sit in the area where they were having their lunch, made them all sit so that Stuart could get his photographs taken with all of them. So there's a, there's a really, really nice man for you. Mm -hmm. yes. And we're unaffected by who they managed. We're unaffected by whether they were green or blue. Right. Well, they, 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 you could only speak as you found. And for me, Walter Smith was a top bloke. Big Billy, Tommy. I tell you, now, so when I used to enjoy a lunch with David Hay. Yeah. yeah. I could turn into bed and breakfast, yeah. actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, David, David, and, and I was particularly probably, you know, with Graham Soonis as well. And, yeah. and you know, I, I'd, so I, you don't sit here and go, people would accuse you, you were pals with. Yeah, well, I, I have his, Billy O'Neill was brilliant. What is a pal? You, you know, you go to you, you his house, you, you, you go for lunch, you, you, you extend contact. And, and, and I would say, the, the guys that, that, that Hughes mentioned and, and Soonest and I were, were actually pretty, pretty thick as well. Did so, you find it hard to slaughter them when, when you had to? That's interesting, that. Good question, that's Thanks sad. very much, Chip. No, it's, <laughs> I thought you'd get one eventually. That was off the <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a very... So, uh, that, I, I think the honest answer to that, do I find it hard? Yeah, I think you do. I th but if someone is, you know, helping you in the grand style by giving you information to help you very much with your job, uh, and they make a mistake. I think you, I think it's all human nature that you're more likely ignoring it. That's the wrong, maybe the wrong word, but to play it down. I think eventually, yeah, you've got to come and say to someone, look, and you might even say to them personally, like, that's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in fact, I've done that as well. But I think if someone is putting, ultimately putting food in your mouth, if I'm working and, and, and Graham Soons and I were, for a point he was a manager of Rangers. I mean, my career took off a, a lot to do with Graham Soonis so being a manager of Rangers. Do, Sorry? What sort of stuff would he do for you? I, you know, he, he, he just it seemed to... He, he, he'd give me stories. stories he'd give me stories that, you know, that he wasn't giving to other people. Uh, and, and I was either running the... For example, when he was... When, he was, when we were going to the World Cup, I was working, I'm working for the Glasgow Evening Times. We were going to the World Cup in 1986, and... It's on in the media and the, the the team on the plane flying to to America before we went on to, to Mexico, and I'm sitting and, and halfway across the Atlantic. He goes right, uh, and he sits beside me. Nobody for rows either way, just the two of us. He says, "Do this bottle of champagne." So he's putting. He says, "What's this?" He said, "Them right, you're a Glasgow region. I was born in Govan." He says, "You're streetwise." Because it just been announced he was manager, he was coming manager Rangers after the World Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about it. I said, "Let me tell you about it." He says, "Tell me what I'm going to do about Rangers manager." So he starts to tell me, and he's pouring champagne. And I mean, I don't want you to think that drink would loosen my tongue, Simon. <laughs> so because that's what I don't know why it's loose in here. I'm not seeing a drink to say. So he says, he yeah, says, wallet, he right? says <laughs> so he says to me, he was wearing a, a cross and a chain around the neck. I said, well, "I don't think." I said, "Before we go any further." I don't give a monkey's what you wear, but I think there's certain people wouldn't be happy that the Rangers manager, this is 1986, mm -hmm. is wearing, he said, Danielle, his wife, then wife, gave it to me. I said, fine. I said, I think it's lovely. I don't have a problem. I'm telling you what other people might think. And then he said, and I'll, I'll, sign, I'll sign Catholics for, for, for Rangers. And he went on. And at that point, you, I'm sitting there full of champagne. I went, can, can I use any of this? <laughs> he says, yeah. And I thought, and I'd quickly, I quickly started to write all this down and he poured his hat out about what to do with Rangers. And wow. so, and I'm thinking, so now, but in retrospect, I think, in a sense, he was using me because he knew I was in the Glasgow Evening Times. I couldn't wait to get to, to America. And of course, the time difference, phone the office. I think I've got a story, which was a splash. 
centre page pull out, two and three, and the editor had wondered, because Alan Davison, God rest him, was the number one sports writer in our paper, I was number two, and he thought about sending me, I justified that. If I did nothing else mm -hmm. in that trip, I justified all that, I will, I will sign a Catholic, Rangers manager, yeah, page wow. one. At the I know it seems nothing now, but 1986, it was a phenomenal story. Sunday Mail launched a, a monthly magazine, and we obviously wanted the first one to be a, a belter. So I phoned Graham, and I said, look, there was only one person that we wanted to be our cover story, and that was you, which was a complete lie. <laughs> <laughs> but he had his secretary um, send over the directions to Blackburn Rovers training complex. Went down, and it, by then, Graham had had major heart surgery, and he started to tell me about um, starting each day by crying for an hour because the heart surgery made him feel somehow less of a man. This was the kind of post-operation trauma that he was going through. And then he explained the pills he was taking to avoid feeling bad and he went on and on and on and on. And I remember going out after it was all over and I phoned the then sports editor and I said, so starts each day by crying for an hour. I went, oh my God. And then there's the pills, oh my God. And those days when you think, and Chick will have had them, when you think, wow, what a story this is. Uh, I mean, Chick just described it. Uh, brilliant. The, the feeling that you get is quite something. Uh, uh, just on the trips, favourite away trips, there must be, in, I know you've been on thousands, but there must be one that stands it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and for what reason? It's a second good question. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the World Cups in 82 in Spain, 86 Mexico, 90 Italy, didn't go to America in 94, went France 98. Um, the World Cups, I think, but even the first, I mean, how things have changed, Simon. I mean, the first trip I ever went for the paper was the Scottish Daily News with Celtic to Iceland in 75, I think. Um, it was just after Mr. Steen's crash. So Sean Fallon was in charge of the team. And this is how things have changed. Iceland is basically, this is a geography thing, so you will understand <laughs> it, but, but Iceland is basically not far from being one out of out, 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 I mean, it's nothing, right? You can go. Uh, and we went on the Sunday for, for a Wednesday game and back the Thursday night. Now they go, you know, the. They go for a couple of hours, yeah. play the game and come so back. So what would you do for the three days before the game? Well, there was research. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of research. <laughs> um, so so I, that was the first. And I, I began to realise I can see the world here. Mm -hmm. And I have yeah. at, at somebody else's expense. I've been to countries that people would never... Moldova comes to mind has been a very interesting place. Um, you know, all over, I think I've been to about every country in Europe, um, South America, Probably America. Probably well, Sometimes I have to relax, you have to taste <laughs> the local. I used to, I used to bring back, when I went to these countries, I'd buy the local um, drink, you know, whatever it may be, and I, and I kept it. I used to put a neighbour of mine, used to give back this one night, come on, one will drink our way around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, uh, you. Uh, Never invite him though. <laughs> <laughs> I remember getting up an escalator in the Manhattan Hilton. Huh? And this was uh, 1992. Uh, the World Cup draw had been made in Madison Square Garden. So I've walked along Broadway. I've been in Madison Square Garden. I'm now getting up this escalator in the Manhattan Hilton to France making a pitch for the World Cup in 1998. And as I go up the escalator, I see Pelle. I see Franz Beckenbauer. I see Michel Platini. I see a champagne fountain up to the ceiling. And I think, I wonder what the poor people are doing there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it... Was checking the fountain? No. <laughs> it, it, it's not being <laughs> boastful, it is simply the kind of good fortune we have enjoyed. Yeah, I've, life, I've, I've, yeah. I've watched the World Cup on three different continents, Europe, Asia, America. Yeah. 
you know, had, I'd never have seen Japan, Yokohama, uh, Seoul in South yeah. Korea. I'd never have seen those places. Yeah. I'd never have been in the Manhattan Hilton uh, or any of the other things that have happened. It's simply your very, very, very good fortune. Mm -hmm. uh, we're nearly finished. I'll just quickly check. We mentioned the only excuse. When did you first become aware of it and how rich did it make you? <laughs> I think Watson's making more money about me than I'm making it about me. He, um, it started on the radio actually on, uh, what's that programme called? Naked, Naked Radio. Radio. Naked Radio. Started on the radio and people, and it was, and, and, and I, people, would have you heard this programme? No, and I, I couldn't conceive that I was, why would anybody want to rip the net out of me? And of course, you start, the thing evolves into television, only excuse. And I sat and watched it, and I thought, they're all caricatures. No, I thought everybody else was really like them. But a caric why am I the only one that's a caricature? <laughs> and it suddenly dawned to me, surely that's not what I really... And the bizarre one was, Simon, towards the end, you know, because they've, they've gone away from football now, and, went, and I don't think I'm a feature anymore, just a his man, but towards the end, I was sitting in... <clears throat> in my home, my then house, uh, which was a Victorian um, place in, in, in Park Shields at the time, and Johnny was doing this piece as me, leaning against this fireplace, you know, with the like, Christmas, new, the effect of lighting and all that, big tall fireplaces. And I was sitting with my then partner watching it, and I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at Johnny, this is half past 11 in Hogmanay, and I looked at my own fireplace, and I was the one at the telly. And I thought, is that me bastard been in there? <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like my fireplace. <laughs> and and you just that was it just became surreal. Yeah, you know? But was it having the start of the but the Rangers fan as well? Well what happened at the time I'd written a book because uh, again somebody over my money uh, <laughs> that about when Soonest came to Rangers first year, about the revival of Rangers and it made me a lot of money. It was called Rebirth of the Blues. Mm -hmm. And um, just people, at that time, the whole only excuse or naked radio thing was taken off. And there was this assumption, that, well, in fact, I'm just a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was a big Rangers fan. And it kind of stuck pretty super glue, you know, over, over the years. See, I'll tell you a thing Hugh even said to me way back when I, was, I had the St Merns thing and, and, and he was pretend Clyde Bank supporter. <laughs> uh, and, and he said to me, no, no, if you're the rest of Scotland, you may have an affection for a team, Patrick this or that. And Huey claimed, that if you, but you slice and slice and slice and slice and slice and slice till you get to the core, then you're either in West of Scotland, you're either a Rangers fan or a Celtic fan. And I argued with him all these years, and I'm sure he still feels the same way. But that just gets people who are, who are Saints fans or Thistle fans or Mother fans angry. Mm -hmm. I still don't agree with that. Has it always been an obsession with the punters, what teams, journalists and pundits support? I, I think uh, more so today, mm -hmm. because in the, the age of social media, they will, they will make it their business. Yeah. Or to make it up. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to find out um, everything about you. Uh, it's not a big deal. I mean, I honestly believe that neither of us was born uh, looking into a microphone or reading off an auto cue. Uh, we all came from somewhere, we all supported someone. Uh, it, it's not a big deal, as I say. It doesn't matter to me, uh, any player or manager, it doesn't matter to me which school you attended, whether you come from the green half of town or the blue half, it's of no consequence whatsoever. Uh, and we should be allowed to conduct ourselves in that way. But. For me, the rivalry now between Celtic and Rangers is more intense than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a social media phenomenon. Nearly done, just quickly. Gascoigne come to Scotland, any dealings with him? Hundreds. Give us a one great story, check on. Uh, yeah, I'll give you one quite emotional for me. He, um, he was just the most generous, uh, two, quickly. One, one out here, the, the, I think it was a, was it the Hearts Rangers Scottish Cup final? And the Rangers, because I was doing the trackside stuff down here, 
guys that comes out, the players come out, to, they're wee wandering about, the Blazers and all that, they go get the pitch. Most of the Rangers players come back in. I never noticed Gascoigne coming back in. He's up at that, the Mount Floyd end, behind the goal, with the ball boys, and he's taking the jacket off, ties on his, and they're playing what we used to call Scotland, they're going crossing and heading one of the boys <laughs> to the goal. They're knocking about 10 minutes with the ball, kicking, and this is before a, a cup final, <laughs> playing behind the guys. And eventually I knew him quite well, and he came back in. Oh, he's checking it. And I said, uh, but he's got the, the tags now on loose, and the blazers are over. <laughs> Away the day, so they just supposed to get changed. And the ball boys kind of sung around all the ball boys. And the ball boys come in and said, All right, boys, do you enjoy that? Yeah, great. Gaz is the man. I said, what, Did he give you some? What did he get? He said, what, Look at what, what he gave you, chat. He gave them 50 quid each, a 50 pound note each to the ball boys. Amazing, eh? Right, for knocking the ball about 50 quid, 50 pound note each. And the ball boys are, well, obviously, <laughs> delighted. He was just the most generous man. And, you know, Simon, I, my, you know, I lost my son. And he was on a, he was on a plane coming up from, my, my boy was mad about motorbikes. Uh, and he, he lost, he, he sat beside Keith on this plane and Keith wasn't really into football. Suddenly, it's Keith's mother, she did, <laughs> but they kind of realized, because everybody else is around Gaza, that this boy might be fair. And even they realised this is Paul Gascoigne. So they get talking, and Keith's fascinated the motor motorbikes in Gaza had a Harley Davidson, and he was the only, so him and Keith were talking motorbikes, motorbikes. So he said, I'm going to give you, I'll get, I got all this kit from, from Harley Davidson, I'll give you the leather jackets, t shirts. And all so the next week I'm at Ibrox, he comes, I've got, I met your lad. And he said, I've got, I've got. I said, don't, Paul, don't worry about it. He said, No, no, I'll get his stuff for him, I'll get his stuff. Uh, in tomorrow, I said, I'll be Irish. So, so he comes in he said, and he said, Jimmy, five bills, but out of the car. And he came back with this pile of stuff, leather jacket, all this Harley Davidson gear. That's for your lad, lovely lad. Amazing. Amazing. He was just brilliant, you know. Great story, and Keith, man. God rest him, Gaza became a kind of hero, although he didn't like football, you know, because uh, a good motorbike thing amazing, going on. Amazing, amazing. He's totally the gas going, gives a Tommy Burns on to end. Uh, he insists that we go to uh, This Is Your Life Night for uh, the Janny in his old school. Uh, so... He, <laughs> this wasn't Eamon Andrews, though, this uh, is <laughs> But he turns up, uh, Tommy always called my wife Janice. Her name's Janet. <laughs> uh, and and uh, he said to him, and she only called him Burns for some reason. Uh, they loved each other dearly, but he thought her name was Janice and she only called him Burns. So uh, we turned up and she said, Burns, that's a fancy car, that. Uh, and he said, oh, bought it yesterday. Uh, and he told us the price and it was substantial. So we go and we go to his old school up, up the East End. And uh, I said, you're going to park it here, are you? And he said, Hugo, Thomas Burns. Diplomatic immunity. <laughs> so in we go, and he said, we were sitting at the table. Big Jerry Collins was there as well. And he said, Where's your coat? I said, It's in a coat room, go and get it. I said, But we well, well, just got you. He said, Go and get it. I said, Why? He said, Don't steal it. <laughs> I said, You've just <laughs> left his <laughs> Hugo, Thomas Burns. Excellent. Diplomatic Bravo. immunity. So we go out at the end of the the, the, the night, which was fantastic. And they tried to yank the driver's side door off with their bare hands. This beautiful one-day-old car. So I said, listen, Tom, what are you going to do? He said, no, no, no. Go back to your place, son. That's what I said, go back to your place. So Tom is holding on to the door of the car with his right arm. He's got the steering wheel with his left arm. Rosemary, his wife, was changing the gear. <laughs> and we were sitting in the back thinking, <laughs> What's going on there? I said, Tam, you realise if, if you get stopped, what does this look like? But, as I say, you could be friendly with Tam, Walter, any and all of them, uh -huh. uh, because it was about the relationship that they had with you and, and that you had with them. And, that was all that mattered. Great time in football. It's been great listening to you as well. Thanks very much. Really enjoying it. Pleasure, Simon. Talk to you. See you. Start away, Peter Head. <laughs> <laughs> the old road. <laughs>